Okay. Yes, sir. I am here. Much. Am I visible? Uh, am I audible? Ah, uh, you are audible, visible, and looking very smart. You are starting. Thank you so much, sir. Presentation. Thank sir. you, sir. Thank you. Are my slides visible? First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me on this esteemed platform. I really appreciate the topic angina with normal coronaries. It's also called the syndrome X. Most of the times, we observe that patient is having typical cardiovascular symptoms, typical ischemic symptoms, ECG changes, stress test positive, but the angiogram is normal. Once the angiogram is normal, the patient and the doctor starts thinking that there is no coronary artery disease. The entire discussion is going to be based on this. I had a 46-year-old female who was non-diabetic, had repeated episodes of chest pain with three ER visits, dynamic STT changes, troponin borderline, 2D equal normal, and angiography was normal. This patient's angiogram was done today morning. Way back in 2009, I recollect having a patient who was 50 years old, diabetic, with repeated visits to the ER for chest pain. She had come to the ER more than 20 times. Non-specific STT changes, borderline positive troponin on and off, serial 2D echoes were normal. She had undergone an angiogram three times, which was normal. One fine day, she was brought dead to the casualty. The question here is, Myocardial ischemia may occur without visible coronary artery stenosis. The next point to ponder is, is myocardial ischemia a cause of symptom in all patients? Not all myocardial ischemia may produce symptoms, ECG, TMT changes, and angiographically visible lesions. Moreover, Angiogram shows only the visible epicardial coronary stenosis in the large arteries. Unfortunately, with the coronary angiogram, we cannot see the microvascular dysfunction or the lesion in smaller arteries, subendocardial arteries. There can be a patient with non ischemic causes of cardiac related pain or non cardiac chest pain, or in some cases, there may be patients who are having abnormal pain perception, like sympathovagal imbalance with sympathetic predominance, in which they would have perception to the arterial stretch caused by changes in heart rate, rhythm, and contractility. This topic is so very important because 10 to 30% of angiograms would fall in this range we do label 30% of positive stress tests as false positive if the coronary angiogram does not show any obstructive coronary artery disease. This syndrome is more common in premenopausal women. Clinical and ECG changes suggestive of myocardial ischemia are no longer benign. We just can't dismiss the symptoms because whatever said and done, even if the coronaries are normal, this entity called syndrome X is associated with high death, high myocardial infarction, hospitalization with heart failure, two times more than the normal population. So it's important to rule out this entity. The causes can be manifold a vasospastic angina, or a misinterpreted angiogram in which there would be a flush coronary occlusion or having a diffuse atherosclerosis. In patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there might be increased, increased subendocardial pressure, which may be leading to coronary compression. A forceful ventricular contraction or an abnormal pain sensitivity 
may also present like this. Some of the patients may have a treadmill positive and a normal coronary angiogram with typical symptoms. These patients may have endothelial dysfunction, microvascular dysfunction, coronary spasm, myocardial bridging, or microvascular angina. There may be myocardial metabolic abnormality or subendocardial ischemia. Subendocardial ischemia may present as having arteriolar resistance in the smaller vessels or having microvascular angina. Well, pathophysiologically, there would be increased lactate production by exercise or pacing. Or coronary artery reactivity testing would also show endothelial or microvascular dysfunction. On CT, the calcium score in these patients is higher than the normal patients who are, who are having no obstructive vascular disease or are having no coronary artery disease. But the CT calcium score is lower than the patients who are having obstructive coronary artery disease. Let's try to understand the microcirculatory dysfunction. Well, atherosclerosis is just one tool which we can see and assess by fractional flow reserve and intravascular ultrasound. Microvascular dysfunction is another entity which needs to be assessed by coronary flow reserve and index of microcirculatory resistance. Endothelial dysfunction, thrombosis, cellular adhesion molecules, pro-inflammatory cytokines, the list is endless. These all patients are at a high risk of future obstructive coronary artery disease. There is an increased response to vasoconstrictive stimuli and a decreased response to vasodilators like Nicorandum. There would be abnormal endothelial dependent vasoreactivity and demonstrable perfusion defects on SPECT, PET, or cardiac MR. The ECG may have non-specific changes 2D echo may or may not have LV dysfunction. Stress echo may or may not show an abnormality. The TMT may or may not show an abnormality. And all ischemic testings may be equivocal. We must note that these kinds of patients are usually premenopausal women. Obstructive CAD is more commonly seen in postmenopausal women. These patients have atypical symptoms, right from fatigue, breathlessness, nausea, epigastric pain, to quite excruciating heaviness in the chest, breathlessness, chest discomfort. The range of symptoms can be from one extreme to the other extreme. These disabling symptoms affects the quality of life, job, and cause frequent ER visits. But the patient and the doctor have no diagnosis. The treatment is questionable. But unfortunately, all these carries a high morbidity, high mortality, and frequent hospital visits. Let's try and understand the COVADIS criteria for microvascular angina. One, Symptoms of myocardial ischemia, absence of obstructive coronary artery disease, objective evidence of myocardial ischemia, and evidence of impaired coronary microvascular function. The clinical characteristics of microvascular dysfunction in absence of coronary artery disease and myocardial disease, this can be endocrine dysfunction, Microvascular dysfunction in presence of myocardial disease like dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Microvascular dysfunction in presence of obstructive coronary artery disease in terms of acute coronary syndrome, non ST elevation and myocardial infarction, which can cause slow flow. And post intervention, also, there might be slow flow and no reflow in all these patients. So this is a wide spectrum 
of, of the clinical characteristics of these patients. Diagnosis, of course, do not neglect the patient. Whatever the patient says is correct. We are here to treat the patient and not the investigation. We might be treating a, a conventional coronary angiogram as gold standard, but we need to take it with a pinch of salt. ECG might be having non-specific STT changes. Breast and stress 2D echo might be normal. 30% of the times, the TMT is discounted as false positive. FFR, which is the fractional flow reserve, might be considered for functional assessment. The intravascular ultrasound can have a spectrum ranging from a normal coronary artery to diffuse atherosclerotic artery and having myocardial bridging. Well, this is an angiogram of a patient who was having a left anterior descending artery looking absolutely normal. The fractional flow reserve is 0 0.79, which is positive. 0 0.80 is the cutoff value for FFR. This is the intravascular ultrasound images which show diffuse atherosclerosis all along the coronary artery. So these are the kind of patients who fit in syndrome X. PET is a very important tool for diagnosing these patients having syndrome X. In this case, this patient is having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We have a rest and stress images in short axis, vertical axis, and horizontal axis for PET. We see increased tracer distribution at rest in the anterior, anteroceptive, anterolateral, and apical walls. However, at stress, we see there is reduced tracer uptake. This can be because of interstitial fibrosis, microvascular dysfunction, or increased intravascular resistance in the smaller vessels. We can also correlate the myocardial blood flow. In this, we see at rest and at stress. Similarly, at rest and at stress, there's a large area of stunt or hibernating myocardial. Correlating this PET with MRI, with late gadolinium enhancement. PET, cardiac MR are highly promising as they calculate the myocardial blood flow in ML per gram per minute of the tissue. This patient had classical angina, normal epicardial coronaries, but when we did a cardiac MR, there was globally impaired myocardial perfusion reserve, no classical area of punched out defects. We can also do endothelial function testing with acetylcholine. Here is an angiogram, which was appearing normal, but when intracoronary acetylcholine was given, it was showing stenosis. This angiogram was appearing normal. The FFR was also normal, but the index of microcirculatory resistance was high. The normal value being 25, up to 25 being the cutoff, is 27.9. The prognosis, as per the CAS registry, 96% survival for a normal coronary angiogram and 92% for mild obstructive CAD. For patients with syndrome X, the mortality rate is twice as compared to an absolutely normal individual. Persistent symptoms also have higher mortality. Ischemic response to exercise have higher mortality. I would need another one minute. Yes. yes this sir. shows very clearly that patients with normal endothelial function and good myocardial blood flow have a good event-free survival but with mild to moderate endothelial dysfunction or severe endothelial dysfunction with myocardial blood flow reducing, the event rates are pretty much high. No guidelines are available. The treatment is, of course, weight loss, risk factor modification, 
hypertension, diabetes control, and symptomatic management. Beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARB would remain the cornerstone for therapy. Statins, of course, are the magic drug. Nitroglycerin sublingual has paradoxical effects on blood flow. Calcium channel blockers do not improve symptoms. Two trials have shown promising results with ranulazine. Estrogen replacement in postmenopausal women is being tried. Imipremin and psychological therapy are also suggested, but there's no concrete evidence for the same. We now try to understand the approach for syndrome X, that is a patient who is having typical symptoms, ECG changes, plus minus stress test changes, but a normal coronary angiogram. These patients may have microvascular dysfunction. In clinical practice, as of today, cardiac MR, PET, or CT, these are the imaging modalities which should be preferred in these patients. PET and CMR are more promising, non-invasive modalities of treatment and diagnosis. Most important, have an eye of suspicion when you see a symptomatic patient with a normal angiogram. We are here not to treat angiograms, we are here to treat patients. And aggressive risk factor modification and symptomatic treatment. With ACE inhibitors, statins, beta blockers, plus minus ranolazine can be beneficial to the patient. I repeat, I don't, eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. Most often, a normal coronary angiogram is discounted for and is unaccounted by the doctor and the patient. And the patient goes home without treatment. Coming back to my first example, when my patient had multiple ER visits, three normal angiograms, and was brought dead. This entity should not be missed. It should be kept in mind. Thank you so much for your patient hearing.